Hey, good afternoon again. Welcome. Uh, this is the, I think, the last of the at least scheduled, previously scheduled Reef Academies for the summer for the interns. Um, thank you for sitting through many of these. I, I recognize most of your faces, and um, it's, it's good to have you back again. I, you know, we started out at the beginning of the summer talking about the anatomy of a deal, what a deal looked like, and, and what its constituent parts looked like. <clears throat> and uh, what we might expect is so, for example, in a reef deal, we might we we would expect to have three different tracks in a deal running all at the same time, right? We have, and so if we talk about either multifamily acquisition uh, or a hospitality uh, project, we'd have the track of the 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 actual deal itself, that is, the acquisition of the property, and all the stuff that goes along with that, from contracting at the beginning. Uh, with the seller to buy it and all the negotiation that goes into that and then getting the, the, the documents and the underwriting information, all the financials and everything else we need so that underwriting can step in and go through their process it, toward acquisition. And then at some point we come to an inflection point where we make a decision about whether we're actually going to buy it and close or not. We'll, we'll negotiate a contract, get it under contract with a diligence period in it. And we'll go through the diligence period and we'll make a decision before we get to the end of the diligence deadline. We'll say, yeah, we want to buy it or not. And if we don't want to buy it, we send a termination letter. We get our money back and we go on down the road. If we want to buy it and we feel comfortable with the diligence as we've worked it up, then we put up some more earnest money typically and it carries on and then we end up at a closing. At the same time, you might remember that in a deal, there's another track going on. Uh, and that is the money track. And we'll just, I'll, I'll just call it the money track. And that's really two phases, you remember? The lending phase, that is part of the, the total amount of money that's gonna get spent on the project is gonna be funded by a loan, one or more loans, depending upon what kind of project it is. And the other part is gonna be funded by equity. And so each of those three pieces is running contemporaneously in parallel but they're not running at the same time. Some horses are further ahead than others at any given point in time. Um, so we have to time those out so that we hit the closing and then go into what we talked about next, and that is transition. Transition from simply closing the transaction, which, you know, uh, buying is hard, selling is easy. We often say in the M&A business, uh, buying requires a lot of diligence a lot of thinking, and we'll talk about some of the problems with that today. Um, and then the really hard part, and I've said, I'm, I'm on record as saying this before, the really, really hard part of being an acquirer of any kind of business is not really the acquisition, but the transition from takeover and then into your organization or the buyer's organization's processes, protocols, procedures, um, uh, training staff, the, the, the prior staff and the way they did business is going to be different from the way the acquirer does business going forward and requires certain uh, kinds of protocols. Uh, it's the transition that's very difficult. Sometimes accounting transitions can be extremely difficult and problematic in acquisitions. You have somebody using one kind of accounting system or worse yet, and I've, I've mentioned this before, and this is not even on one of my one, one of our dirty dozen here for today. Uh, for the academy, I've, I've got a dirty dozen uh, uh, issues of deal, deals gone bad and examples of problems that we'll talk about today. But one of them is not even this transitional accounting issue, but that's an example of an issue that can be a real problem in an acquisition context, that if you're not thinking about that, if you don't have someone on the ground who's an expert, whether it's inside your shop or from the outside, who's an expert at transition in accounting systems, it can be a real problem. And you might spend a whole lot more money than you budgeted trying to transition from their accounting system into your accounting system and restating financials and a number of other things. I mean, even accounting methods can be a problem. Your, your acquisition target may use a method of accounting that you don't use as an organization. And in some respects, sometimes that's driven by regulatory authority. So we're not in this here at Reef, but there are uh, real estate investment trusts, for example, that we do business with. And their responsibility under the securities laws is to, to keep their financial statements 
in a particular way that's dictated by by law, rule, and regulation, and then have them audited that way and present them that way. But if they go out and acquire properties, typically those properties, unless they're acquired from other REITs, typically those properties, th that accounting is not done in the same way. And so it's gonna take transitional accounting time that needs to be budgeted for, and the time needs to be budgeted to make sure that that accounting gets done correctly and it's translated over, right? This is one example of the kind of problem that you need to be aware of when you get into a deal. Don't be just thinking about the stuff that's right in front of you as you go through the deal, especially just in the acquisition track. Make sure you're paying, paying attention to the lending track and to the capital stack, the, the equity capital track at the same time. And, and there's different levels of expertise or different kinds of expertise that come in or that are required within each of those tracks, obviously. And so make sure and this is probably rule number one in, in all kinds of business, is make sure that you've, you, you've obtained appropriate advisors who are truly experts in those areas that are going to be critical path items in any particular transaction, whether you're the, a seller or a buyer or a co-venturer or co-participant. Uh, get good advisors. It's always critical that you get good advisors. You cannot know all the answers. I cannot know all the answers. We rely on lots of experts, both inside our disciplines and outside our disciplines, to make sure that we're prepared, not only here at Reef, but you know, at every client deal I do, to make sure that we've answered the questions that we can think of to answer. Okay, so that kind of gets us to uh, uh, point number one, uh, in our list. And so you've got a, a handout in front of you and on the backside, I'm sorry, we were saving paper today, saving trees. Um, the backside of that has these, these 12 items and I just call them a dirty dozen, not the dirty dozen, because I'm sure we can come up with a whole lot of, of the difficult areas to talk about um, that, that end up being problems in deals or cause deals to actually go bad. And, and when I say go bad, that can be any number of, you can describe that in any number of ways. It may not be that the deal craters or fails in its entirety, but it just doesn't meet the expectation that the acquirer came in with. And, and there may have been, again, a variety of reasons why, and it may be a compilation uh, of a whole bunch of things. Um, sometimes we, we talk about the perfect storm um, and, and I'll give you some examples of some things that have happened uh, that, that I'm, and, and, and many of these, by the way, let me make a disclaimer here. It's important that you understand what we're going to talk about today in these sort of dirty dozen apply to every single deal that I've been involved in over the course of the last 31 years in my practice as an M&A lawyer. Um, they don't apply specifically to Reef nor are any of these uh, examples I'm going to give today or talk about today necessarily specific to Reef, although we deal with uh, many, many of these contingencies as we go down through our acquisition tracks and development tracks, we deal with a lot of these, these categories of issues and try to make sure that we're out in front of them. I will tell you uh, from the outset um, that, you know, since, since we're all human beings in this room, we're, we're all subject to, to missing things from time to time. I do. I have. Um, and I'm going to give you some examples. And I'll tell you of one that I missed toward the end that, uh, that I still believe today was, was not correctly interpreted by a court. But my clients spent four years in court arguing over several issues in contracts that I, I was involved in. I mean, they, they were my work product in the acquisition and the development process. And it wasn't a real estate development project. It was a business. It was a business project uh, and, and effectively kind of a joint venture and contract arrangement between two commercial parties. And um, they got sideways some number of years into the deal. One party was looking for an out. And um, uh, because it wasn't working economically for them, that's usually what happens, by the way. When people want to get out, it's because the business deal's not working for them anymore. They just made a bad business deal and don't like it anymore. And then they go back to the legal documents to try to find a way out if they can. And they'll do that every, every single time 
in an effort to use that as leverage to come back to the table and renegotiate a different deal, whether that's an exit or a change in pricing or other terms. Um, so just be aware that, 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 that that's out there. But otherwise, let me just say, none of these are specific examples of anything that's happening at Reef. This is not about Reef. This is about telling you about how business deals can go bad and the issues we need to be thinking about as we go through them. So you ought to be able to take this discussion and even this list of stuff on with you into any business, look at it, and, and, and kind of tick through these items and make sure you're paying attention to them. And by the way, I've also not attempted one more disclaimer. I've not attempted to order these in any order of importance, but rather really in an order that in which a deal occurs. Uh, sort of sequentially, chron chronologically, in which a deal uh, occurs. So um, at least I've tried to do that. So let's let's jump into the first one. So, uh, oh, one other one other thing I wanted to say to you, and I'm sorry I didn't put it on. A lot of times I'll, I'll, when I do my presentations, I'll put a quote at the top of the presentation that has some relevance to to the presentation. And today, uh, I, I I just didn't get it on on there. But today's quote is from General George Patton. Uh, well-known Second World War general uh, uh, that you, you may have heard of. Um, and he says this, prepare for the unknown by studying how others in the past have coped with the unforeseen or the unforeseeable and the unpredictable. That's appropriate for us today. This stuff we're talking about, that is getting into business deals, has incredible levels of not only complexity, but unpredictability. The markets you work in, the transactions you do, the efforts you make to try to predict, to do some predictive modeling into the future is just fraught with uncertainty. And we try to do fancy things, especially those of you that are, are um, I mean, you're all in, in, in school or most of you are in school. You know, you get, you know, we get these fancy finance degrees and all sorts of things. And we talk about net present value and IRR and we get into fancy, you know, uh, risk adjusted uh, discount rates and all kinds of things like that. Right. Those are all efforts to try to quantify risk and then adjust for it. Correct. Those are all assumptions. Assumptions. Don't ever forget that. Those are assumptions. And we're trying to make those assumptions based on some level of understanding of not only the business, but the environment we're going to be working in, and, and some likely some, some effort to predict what the capital environment is going to look like later, what the markets are going to look like, what the particular business is going to look like, or that particular market for that business is going to look like, whether it's national, international, or even just local, like a multifamily property. But remember, that's predictive analysis, and it is fraught with uncertainty. I, I, give me an uncertainty that two years ago, none of us ever thought would even occur. Give me one that's hit our, that's hit our lives and our business, every single one of us. Come on, COVID, COVID. Nobody's ever given thought to that. In a, in a, in, I mean, seriously, in a business, I, I could take you through a hundred uh, securities disclosure documents for offerings in property, property matters that were all published before 2018, 2007, 2019, 2020. Nobody's talking about health risk of any kind. People aren't talking about it. They talk about all kinds of other risks. They aren't talking about health risks. And all of a sudden, we have a new contingency that history now tells us we need to pay attention to and deal with. Because it wasn't just a health risk, was it? What's happened as a result of it that's hit our business? Not only tenant delinquencies, right? But what happened to the ground up in, on the ground up side? Those of you that are in, in, in ground up in construction. Depending on what state you're in. Sorry? Depending on what state you're in. Well, but, but what happened nationally, even internationally? Market. Excuse me? Supply chain. To supply chain. That, that's the wider category. Lumber is one example of it, right? But steel did the same thing. The price of building steel went through the roof, right? And, 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 and why would that happen? 
because people weren't able to go to work to produce the materials because you can't produce those materials. Unlike a bunch of us, we can go sit at a computer anywhere and produce work product. You can't produce lumber without people putting their hands on it. <laughs> you have to have real live workers, live bodies standing there doing the job. Steel's the same way. We've automated a bunch, but you still have to have people on shifts regularly doing their stuff. And all of a sudden, we don't just have delivery problems, which people think about supply chain. We've actually got supply problems. We can't produce it. It's not being produced right now, right? I mean, well, it, it is now, but, but at the time, right? All of a sudden we see a, a dip in, in the, the, the manufacture or the production of all of those underlying raw material items. And then six, eight months later, the prices of those are absolutely upside down crazy. And every budget of every, uh, uh, you know, uh, on the ground developer or ground up developer in, in the world have just gone upside down, right? It's not just us, it's everybody. So um, these are the kinds of contingencies that we, we, we need to learn from. And so Patton's word is a good one. Prepare for the unknown by studying how others in the past have coped with the unforeseeable and the unpredictable. How have they coped with it? What have they done to deal with it once it happened? Not This is not, you know, prescience, the ability to foresee something, although that's a very important part of what we're talking about today, is the ability to learn from the past, put it on your checklist, and make sure you don't miss that one. But there are other things that will happen during your career that you're going to see for the first time. And you need to put it on your checklist and make sure you put that in the back of your brain and don't forget that one, right? We do it all the time, but that's an, it, it, I thought that was a worthwhile word from General Patton. <clears throat> okay, so first one. Poor deal-making or anticipation of contingencies and possible negotiation. So when I say poor deal-making, I'm talking about understanding your own business, and then understanding the parameters of the business or target that you're seeking to acquire and truly understanding that business and what its likely contingencies are that that, that business deals with on a daily basis or that's hanging around out there back lurking in the background that may happen once in a career, but it's something that everybody in that industry is aware of and, and, and knows is potentially out there. Now, sometimes those kinds of risks, like all these risks as we talk about them, are risks that business people are simply willing to take. They will try to quantify it if they can and, and seek to adjust pricing to, to, to make sure that on a risk-adjusted basis, they're able to justify. But it's, you know, at risk is de de decision-making under conditions of uncertainty, right? And so we do this every day. But th the idea of failing to make the right deal because you didn't understand the business that you're in, first of all, and then the business that the target is in, secondly, how those are going to work together, whether they'll be compatible or not, whether there will be unforeseen uh, difficulties in, as I said, transition or customer bases. For example, I've, I mean, I've been involved in deals where... The, the acquirers of a target failed to consider that the customer base that they had in their existing business was going to have some potential conflict with the customer base of the new target acquisition. Many times the targets will be acquired because it's an, it's an add-on to the customer base and you can do some cross-selling. There are also some situations in which there are antagonisms between those potential customer bases because they may be involved in other businesses that you're not anticipating. So you need to be, look very carefully at things like customer bases. Uh, obviously, when we do a, an acquisition of a multifamily property uh, here at Reef, we don't really have that kind of issue. We don't have to worry about what the effect is gonna be on a, on, on a target customer base by acquiring that property in that location, generally, we don't have to. If we acquire, if we already have properties in that locale, we may want to think about whether the whether the, the new acquisition will be something that upgrades 
our presence in the market or downgrades the presence in the market and what the effect of that may be on the other properties we have in the market, right? These are the kinds of conditional uh, things, contingencies that you need to give some thought to as you, before you get into the deal as part of your diligence. Don't just simply go through the checklist, uh, you know, the acquisition checklist that's, you know, that's on the site, and we've got one uh, that we use, but don't simply go through that and assume that that covers the ground. Think, ask yourself questions outside of the, you know, the normal stuff. Understand the market, understand the specific market you're in, uh, try to ask questions about it. So, and, and also understand when you make a deal that potential outcomes are likely to differ from what you might imagine. And, and, and the reason for that is because there are a lot of different, as we've already talked about with COVID, there are a lot of different possible reasons why a deal may not work the way you thought it was going to. So it's important for you to keep an open mind as you approach an acquisition, go through the diligence phase, and, and, the, and especially the deal-making phase, to try to conjure up the concepts uh, or, or, or limitations to your usual underwriting and decision-making process, the questions you ask. Ask whether you're asking the right questions. I often say, we often say, and, and, and I'm not a litigator, but you know, you'll hear litigators say from time to time a really good one, and that is, if you want a better answer, ask a better question. So ask better questions if you can. And what do I mean by better? More informed, right? Understand the underlying intricacies of the various elements of the transaction that are going on. And, and, and as you dig down into it, don't lose the forest for the trees, but as you dig down into it, begin to ask really pertinent questions. It'll help you understand what the risks are and then what adjustments need to be made in the business deal so that you off that risk to the other party as much as possible, right? So, and we'll talk a, a, a bunch about risks here. So that's a, a, item number one. Second one, poor economic and legal modeling and analysis. So it's one thing to go out and find all the, get all the data and even ask the right questions and get it in hand. Then, then uh, we often say in golf, there's a, you know, a lot of misses between the lip and the cup. It's critical that you take that data and that information that you have and then translate it into relevant economic and risk models that will allow you to predict, <laughs> if, if we can use that, that word, uh, predict what this should look like under our new regime, which is what we have to do every single day, right? I mean, that's what underwriting does every day. So we gather all this information and get a good, a wide understanding of the markets and everything else, and then we have to put that information to work in risk-based modeling and in legal analysis modeling. So we read the contracts. We read the underlying contracts. And we don't just read the underlying contracts in, in stuff outside of our property work that we do here in, an, in, in other kinds of M&A. We'll go back and read all of the fundamental industry regulations and all of the, the, the fundamental licenses, permits, and other rights that parties may have, depending upon what industry it is and what the competitors may have, to be able to analyze whether what we're going to be acquiring will give us a base that will allow us to compete against those existing rights. So you have to have people who are actually going to sit down and do what? Read. Somebody's got to read it all. This is one of the things that I think that people fail to see and hear today especially in our internet-based market. And I'll say this to you, uh, I've, I've sort of said it to you probably peripherally, but I'll say this to you. I, I personally believe, and I know I'm older, so I'm in an older generation, I still use paper and still write on paper and read, read paper, okay? Reading and writing are critical skills for success in business. If you wanna separate yourself from your fellow competitors for jobs and opportunities in your sphere of influence, whatever it is, be a great writer and be a great reader. Do it often, do it well, don't skip it. Don't fail to do that. 
As you go forward and we see AI become more prevalent, there's going to be more ability to use this thing and go find an answer quickly. But it's not going to think for you. It's not going to coalesce all of the things together that only someone with a wide berth of experience and range of perspective is going to be able to see through and find a way to get something done that AI is not going to provide. So read, write, listen, learn to ask better questions. Poor economic and legal modeling and analysis. Failure to see legal issues and truly comprehend them and then quantify them. Quantify them. Quantify the legal exposure. Most people in business don't want to spend time because they don't like lawyers. Understand that? I have thick skin, got a thick hide, been doing it a long time, I'm okay with that. I'm okay that you don't like me. I don't create the problems. The law is out there. The question is whether you're gonna deal with it or not, right? The question is whether you're gonna deal with it or not and how you're going to deal with it. You can deal with it poorly or you can deal with it well. Your choice, your risk. So we don't make the problems. We're trying to find a way to help you get through the minefield of problems that exist out there and they're constantly changing and evolving, right? So make appropriate estimates of legal risks. I'll give you an example, and I will give you an example in Reef, in, in what we do at Reef. We have to estimate what the risk of likely tenant defaults are, right? And one would argue that that's really property management, just simply looking at economics, right? And you can tell what failure to pay rates are and those sorts of things. But one of the things that we also need to be doing a bit better job of, but we haven't had a lot of history of it, fortunately, we've been very fortunate here at Reef with all the properties we have and all the, the, the people's families that live in our properties, we haven't had a whole lot of injury litigation or, or tenant claims litigation in our entire portfolio. I mean, relatively speaking, we, we always have some, but we've had very little uh, to speak of. And, and we've been fortunate in that respect. I think we've done a good job of continually paying attention to the properties and then updating them and try to meet the, the, the tenants where they are, right, in their expectations in our properties. Properties are never perfect, right? There are always things that happen, maintenance things that happen, you know, things break, they, they, they don't work. I mean, I just got a home, uh, just moved into a new home, and one of the furnaces is not, or the air conditioners is not working right, and I've had the guy out three times already, and he, he still hasn't fixed it, and I paid tw for it twice, and I'm not paying for it again. <laughs> I'll just go on the record, I'm not paying for it a third time. It, but, but these are the kinds of things that just happen, right? I mean, this is just, this is just the management of business. But we need to take, make estimates of what we think the legal risks are of those kinds of tenant claims. Most of that's covered by insurance, right? That's why we buy insurance policies to cover that sort of stuff. We have both CGL, uh, commercial general liability, which covers those kinds of slip and fall or injury type claims. And then we have property and casualty, we call it PNC coverage, which is uh, you know, for, for damage to the property itself, you know, uh, apartment burns or, or that sort of thing. And, and somebody gets hurt as a result of it. So, it, but, but we need to, do, and I'll come back to the word assumption again. We just need to be careful about the assumptions that we use when we model those things with any particular property and not get into the, the, the rote sense that, oh, well, you know, we, we generally see about this level of claim uh, on a property, uh, so we'll just use that factor in our analysis. Uh, we probably ought to make it specific to this property and to this market and to these types of tenants. We probably ought to do that if we're being wise, make those adjustments, right? So do that in your deals. Pay attention to contingent liabilities that arise from legal factors. And some of them may be regulatory. So for example, something that we don't deal with here, but in other industries, regulatory oversight and authority is significant, significant. The regulators, whether it's the, uh, I mean, I won't use the SEC, but you may have OSHA, for example, in a manufacturing setting. OSHA is, is a significant factor in worker safety. We, you need to budget into your acquisition budget and your expectations, appropriate levels of OSHA compliance that are gonna be required both from a legal perspective and from simple compliance perspective, right? These are the kinds of issues. So look at the business itself. That, that's, I hope I keep coming back to that point with you on all these issues. 
look at the business, the underlying target, the underlying business. I, I often say to my clients, we need to be just as much of an expert in the target before we acquire it as the owner of the target already is. That's our charge. We need to know as much about their business as they know about their business before we close this deal. Okay? We, need, we need to. If we don't, we're going to end up having problems because there will be things that come up that we should have seen or found out about that we didn't know. And that's, that's going to be on us, right? Um, client wherewithal, number three is a good one. It's a good little story. Um, and I, and, I, and this, is, this is actually a client story. I, I obviously won't disclose who it is. But this happened early in my career back in the mid-'80s. Um, and and y'all are, are way too young to remember this, but I'm going to recite a little bit of the history. You might remember the, the, there, there was a financial crisis in the late 80s, it, actually the, the mid-ish, 80, 85, 86, 87 time frame, especially here in Texas, that we refer to as the SNL crisis, the savings and loan crisis. Uh, savings and loans at the time were making, were, were making loans to third parties on the basis of inflated property uh, appraisals. And, and because of that, banks were making more money and fees were being made and all kinds of things were happening. Uh, and, and, and it ended up all sort of tumbling down. And as a result of the SNL crisis, the, the FDIC and the FSLIC uh, came in. There was a new act that was adopted in, I believe it was 88, called uh, FIREA, as I'm, if I'm not mistaken, um, that was all aimed at trying to protect against this sort of financial debacle happening inside of banks and savings and loans, that there were new standards that were established. Well, during those days, uh, during the early 90s, I had an opportunity to represent one of the largest multifamily developers, builders uh, of multifamily properties in the state of Texas. And, uh, and, and that, that this particular organization was building not just in Texas, but had projects in other places. And one of the places they had a project was in Simi Valley, California. Okay, beautiful place, just right, almost right up against the ocean uh, in Southern California, uh, just north of Los Angeles, absolutely beautiful place. And this gentleman was, had made a lot of money and had a lot of wealth and had a, uh, uh, not a relation, not, not relation, but they, they called themselves cousins because they were of the same uh, ethnic background. And they had known each other for many, many years. And this other gentleman was also wealthy, but he lived in Southern California. And they decided to do a joint venture together to develop a 2,000 acre development in Simi Valley, California. It was gonna be this absolutely grand, beautiful residential development, sweeping development all through the hills. It was just going to be incredible. Um, if you watch some, some uh, uh, fairly well-known, uh, I can't remember what you call them these days. I don't, wa I don't watch television. Uh, what do you call the, the, where you, the families you get to see inside the lives of families? Reality, reality TV, right? right? Some fairly well-known reality, reality TV shows. Uh, show up in you know the, the the hills of some famous places in Southern California. This is what that was going to be like, and it was going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars, right? I mean, this joint venture over a very long period of time, and the joint venture agreement was about twenty pages long, and it, and and the the significant element of it that I'm going to tell you about right now is that. The parties agreed to contribute 50-50. It was a straight up 50-50 deal. They agreed to contribute capital in whatever was required to develop the, the property and turn it into this magnificent thing uh, and, and develop real pro you know, lots and everything else and sell it off and share the profits in it 50-50. It was just a straight up, I would call it a naked, straight up 50-50 JV. Okay? Fast forward the tape. They, they started this in the mid-80s. Started in the mid-80s. We go through FIREA and the downturn in the market, in the real estate market in Texas in, in the late 80s. Oil had already turned down. And, and this particular developer in Texas begins to feel some cash crunch. Carries on. 
Well, you would think when you got into a deal in Southern California, in California or anywhere, that you get into a development deal, you ought to be about ready to go in about three, four, five years, right? Wrong. Not in California. In California, every study you do has to be, every environmental study you do has to be redone about every two or three years, and you can't get through local permitting, and the city of Simi Valley would never grant them replat and platting permits and, and permitting. And, and 10 years in, by 1995, they still were not hardly any closer to actually getting the development started than they were in 85, and they'd spent millions on this project. But guess what changed between 85 and 95? Significant downturn in the SNL market and the real estate market here in Texas that ended up causing failures in properties that my client was a guarantor on. And those guarantors started to be called. And the, F and, and the FSLIC stepped into a bunch of failed savings and loans and took all those loans over and then amalgamated them together. And under the documents, the guarantees that were signed, any owner of that guarantee could make a claim against that guarantor for any other debt that was held by the holder of that guarantee. So all of a sudden you have five different lenders that there were guarantees out there, this guy had guarantees with, they've defaulted. Some of these things are still performing. Some of these assets are still performing, but the, but the loans have gone into receivership because the, the, the uh, savings and loans have gone into receivership and they're now all held by the FSLIC or the FDIC. What they held the RTC? Or the, well, in that case, the RTC, right? The RTC and the FSLIC were working together, but you got the RTC all holding these. And so once the RTC becomes the holder of all these guarantees together, even though some of these properties are performing and others are not, they can now call a guarantee under, the, uh, under one loan that wasn't written to be specific to that loan across the entire portfolio of loans. So this client gets called on hundreds of millions of dollars worth of guarantees. Well, cross-defaulted, cross right. Cross -defaulted. Actually, cross-guaranteed is where, yeah, where, cross where it ends up. But, but, but the bottom line is, the, the client in 1985 never anticipated that there was going to be a cash crunch that would ever cause a problem in the Simi Valley development and his obligation to put up half the cash. Guess what the remedy provision said in the Simi Valley development agreement if he failed to put up his cash? If he defaulted, failed to put up the cash, he could be taken out of the deal for cost, at cost. So when you get into deals, this is my point on item number three, client wherewithal assumptions, especially in long horizon deals and their related remedies, make sure you're thinking about, don't just assume that, that, that the, the business you're working for will have the cash available in a long horizon deal to be able to fund up what's going to be required if something happens in the interim that's unexpected and the, the, the success or value of the underlying business that your, your client is in turns down. Don't assume that because when you build the remedies into the, the document, what should have been built into the Simi Valley document was something that no one was thinking about at the time that there would ever be a cash issue, ever. Because by the way, the prospective value of that project was 10 times what the amount of money was that the client had in it. You follow? There was no fair value requirement for a buyout. It was all I gotta do is just, and by the way, the other partner had plenty of money because he wasn't in the same businesses and he didn't have, he didn't have the guarantees called. So he had the ability in cash to just execute and write the check. And now you're out completely, right? So 
you have to think about this ability to perform over a long period of time if you're in a deal like that. Don't, mi don't miss that one. Unrealistic cost and liability assumptions. We've talked about that just a little bit when we were talking about legal modeling and analysis under item number two. But, you know, realism is, is critical in decision making. Realism is critical. Um, you know, I mean, if George Patton was uh, uh, unrealistic in his expectation about winning and losing and how many uh, soldiers he was likely to lose and how much ammunition and fuel was going to be required to get the job done on the North African desert, uh, you know, against Rommel or in Sicily or in France uh, after the Battle of the Bulge or, or whatever. If you see unrealistic about it, didn't make realistic assessments of what the required resources were going to be, it would have come back to kill a bunch of other guys, a bunch of other people, and potentially lose the battles, right? Be realistic in your assumptions. Make sure you build in appropriate contingencies. Poor insurance coverage and contingency reserves. So we've already talked about liabilities like, you know, slip and fall tenant liabilities and other liabilities. I, I talked about manufacturing settings. You need to model in what the cost of injury is going to be if workers are injured, because in a manufacturing setting, they absolutely and most certainly are going to be sooner or later. I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, represented a client uh, that, that was in the tubular business, uh, downhole oil, oil field tubular business. And it maintained a huge pipe yard out in Northeast Houston that, that uh, uh, big oil companies would order that pipe through distributors, but they'd order that pipe and that pipe would be inspected and they'd, they'd do special threading things on it, all those kinds of things. They'd put it on big trucks and ship it out to West Texas or to the Bakken in North, in North Dakota or, 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 or down into the Eagle Ford, right? It, to be drilled and, and put it in the ground. Well, that, some of those pipes are a ton. They literally weigh a ton, right? I mean, it's thick, heavy steel. They're 50 feet long in that range. 45 to 50, 55 feet long, I mean, literally can kill you. I mean, rolled over on you, rolled off the rack, it could kill, kill somebody. And so obviously in settings like that, OSHA not only requires it, but just good sense requires that you have safety protocols, that the people who are out there handling those materials aren't just simply walking around between all the stacks and climbing up on top of them, right? Willy-nilly like children climbing trees. You just, you can't have that stuff going on. So even though you set down these safety protocols, I can tell you, I was at the client's office one day in, in, inside the administrative office and was standing there talking to one of the principals. And I looked out over this hundred acre pipe yard that has stack after stack after stack after stack of these oil field tubulars that are literally 12 feet tall, 12 to 15 feet tall. This is during, you know, this is while we're still, they're still drilling as hard and fast as they can, 2012, 13, 14 timeframe, right? Before the price of oil turns down. I look out there and there's a guy standing on top of one of those racks and he does not have a, 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 one of the orange company safety vests on and a helmet on. I looked out and I tapped my client on the shoulder and I said, do you see that? Somebody needs to call the yard manager. What is that guy doing up there? Come to find out, it wasn't one of our guys. It wasn't one of the client's guys. It was a customer who just simply climbed up on the top. Guess what happened? Before we could get out there and get him off there, he slipped and fell off that 12-foot rack. Broke a vertebra in his back and we end up in a claim. Another good Texism. We fix things here. We fix problems every single day, but we can't fix stupid, right? There are some things you just simply can't keep from happening. Those kinds of contingencies need to be built into your model no matter how crazy or silly that seems. If you can do it, anticipate what that cost is gonna look like, okay? Can't fix stupid. Insurance coverage, one other point I wanna make about that, this is really important. 
just because the business that you're trying to acquire has insurance today and has coverage today and has loss runs today, and we get them on every property acquisition we do, right? We get loss runs so we can estimate what the cost of insurance is going to be and what, that, what, what the cost of underwriting and likely losses are going to be. We do that all the time here. Just because they have that doesn't mean that that profile won't change or that the coverage that you're talking about will be available in the future or that it will be available at a price that you can afford. Don't assume that. Do not assume that. Get good insurance advice from people who truly know not only the markets, but the secondary markets, the underwriting markets. And there are some of these things that you just have a difficult time uh, predicting, but ask the questions. Insurance should not be taken for granted just because you have insurance today and you can pay a premium for it today does not mean that same coverage is going to be available tomorrow or that the coverages themselves are going to be written back by the underwriters, by the insurers in ways that functionally cause the insurance to not cover what it did before. And you'll see that in lots and lots of cases. You thought you were buying and you're even buying the insurance from the same insurance company but they've changed the policy on you so it doesn't cover the kinds of things it did previously. Watch, watch for it. Make sure you're doing that analysis, even annually. Um, conflicts of interest internally will acquire or management and ownership. Look, anytime ownership of an acquirer is managed by that ownership, there are, there are gonna be conflicts of interest. That is, that the, the, the party that has an equity interest in a business, if they're also an officer or a director in the business, is wearing two hats. And those two hats may very well conflict. They may very well conflict at any given point in time. Realize that, see it, and understand what that might mean. Now, it depends on who you are, what your setting is, where you are in the transaction, whether that becomes important or not. But don't forget to evaluate conflicts of interests, even within the acquirer, or I'm not talking about between parties. Parties don't have conflicts of interest. They, they have differences of interest. I'm talking about conflicts of interest within the party that's acquiring the business and whether uh, that particular person who has a conflict of interest will see things one way because they'll want more personal interest uh, or personal benefit out of a deal than would be appropriate for the transaction given the underlying deal and, and the rest of the constituents who are involved. Okay. So you've got that issue. Make sure you're paying attention to that. That can become uh, a subject of litigation and it's not unusual for it to in many cases. Tax issues. You know, there's a whole plethora of tax issues you need to pay attention to uh, and so get good tax advisors. That's, that, that, that's probably the, the message of the day is get good advisors on each one of these subcategories. But, but you've got things like transactional tax, how much, it, what, what, what's gonna have to be paid when we acquire the property or acquire the business? So I'll give you two examples. When we acquire properties, so for example, we're, gonna, we're, we're uh, getting ready to acquire a property in Florida. When we acquire the property in Florida, there's a, there's a, a deed or a transfer tax that has to be paid, and, and a mortgage tax, which is a different rate, but, but, but there are transfer taxes that have to be paid. So you've got transfer taxes. And then, and then you'll have, obviously in our case, you have real property, on, ongoing real property, ad valorem taxes. You may have sales taxes. You may have use taxes, depending upon what kind of business you're in. Pay attention to those, look at them, make sure you understand their reach. You may have tax credits. This is an important one. You may have tax credits in a deal, that exist for the, the target right now, but if you acquire them, that tax credit may go away. It may not be available to you currently. So you may have to figure out how to structure the deal differently to be able to preserve that tax credit and get it for your benefit. Otherwise, you have to adjust the sales price and nobody likes to do that, right? You'll just uh, adjust how the sales price works to recognize that you're not gonna get the tax benefit of that tax credit. Just pay attention to that. Also, with respect to taxes in general, recognize that every single year the legislature gets together and decides whether they're going to rewrite the tax law, right? Don't forget that. 
as you go forward. Many times it's one of the reasons that in the fourth quarter of the year from about September to about this time of the year, uh, moving forward to the end of the year, the M&A business heats up dramatically. Tremendous numbers of transactions done in the fourth quarter. One of the reasons is because budgets are being spent and if they don't get spent by the first of the year, they get, they get lost and rolled over into, into the next year's budget. And the second reason is because the sellers don't wanna take the risk that the tax law will change and that if they have to incur the gain or loss in the following year, that it may be a completely different construct from what they're dealing with today economically because, because taxes do impact economics. Um, uh, Jeff, were you gonna ask a, a question? Yeah, I was gonna, uh, gonna mention um, too, in cases like this too, you gotta think about it on the back end too. Because when you sell a profit, a lot of states will have a, a gross profit tax yeah. on, on, on it. And sometimes you've also got a, a lot of states have state income taxes. So a lot of times when you have an LLC agreement, you're supposed to, you have to, you have to, you have to confiscate or, or take, <clears throat> have that tax on behalf of the person that's invested in the property. Too. So you, there's a lot of, it's just that there's, there's real estate taxes, there's state income taxes, there's state sales taxes, there's federal income taxes. You have to take, you have to evaluate when you're doing these. That's exactly right. Yeah, there's a lot of levels of taxes. So again, get a good tax advisor. There's one point that I wanted to make about the tax issues, and I just made a, 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 a peripheral, I mean, a parenthetical note about it. But that is, in a pass-through entity, so in an entity that's taxed as a partnership or taxed as an S corporation under federal tax law, the, the, the owners have to pay the income taxes on gains that are, are earned by the entity itself and in, usually in their share, in their rateable share of ownership, usually, although sometimes it's a bit different in, in partnerships or entities taxed as partnerships. And by the way, just remember, limited liability companies generally, if they have more than one member, are generally taxed as partnerships here in the United States, at least in small business. There are some situations in which we will make elections to have an LLC taxed as a corporation or as an association taxable as a corporation as part of a larger corporate consolidated group, but that's a higher level tax sort of thing and it's not, one, it's not something that we get into in our practice in general here. Most of the time, most LLCs that have more, again, more than one member will be taxed as partnerships under subchapter K of the Internal Revenue Code. And what that means is that the income is allocated income inside the entity is allocated out to the owners and they have to pay the income taxes on it. So just remember, if you, let's say we, the, the entity made a million dollars in income and there were two partners, 50-50, each of them got an allocation of $500,000 worth of taxable income. Their tax returns are going to have to reflect that $500,000 worth of additional taxable income. So guess what they're going to want? They're going to want to make sure they get some money out of the entity that's allocating them the $500,000 in taxable income. They're gonna want some cash distribution to pay these taxes. And so you're gonna want what we refer to as a mandatory tax distribution provision. Be careful about that, especially in growing businesses where business growth is being financed internally by, by sales. In other words, the business is growing rapidly and you're selling more goods or services or those sorts of things. And, and you're paying for your internal growth, accounts receivable, right? Inventory and accounts receivable is growing. And the way you're paying for that is not by debt, but you're paying for it by reinvesting your profits, right? Which lots of small businesses do. If you do that, all of your tax distribution money is gonna be stuck inside of your accounts receivable, your growing accounts receivable and and inventory, right? And there's not gonna be any cash to distribute. So pay attention to that, depending upon what kind of business you're in, just pay attention. Uh, cash distributions are important for, at least for tax purposes, even in a growing business where we're trying to keep all the cash in, inside the company and grow internally. Make sure you get cash distributions out or provide for that, okay? Um, uh, we're down to a few minutes. Capital uh, offering and fundraising exposures. You know, I did a, a presentation on uh, uh, securities laws in general uh, a few weeks back and just harken back to the notion that both under federal and state blue sky securities laws, there are obligations for appropriate disclosure um, in, in the uh, uh, federal securities area. 10B5 is an important uh, 
uh, section that gets used under the 34 Act, this, uh, the Exchange Act, for uh, investors to make claims against uh, issuers of securities that have failed or, or where the business deal has gone bad. Uh, you, you need to deal with that. And, and the best way to deal with offering and fundraising exposure, uh, it, the best way to deal with it is have appropriate offering and disclosure documents drafted by qualified counsel and make sure that your underlying assumptions in your economic models that are part of the projections that go along with it are reasonable and rational. Uh, I mean, always under promise and over perform is the old business saw, right? And that's, that, that statement applies very well to securities offering, limiting securities offering exposure. Under promise and over perform. Don't over promise and under perform. It creates expectation that's difficult to, to you know, retract again. Get appropriate securities counsel every time you're involved in, in a securities offering of any kind or securities matter. Um, failure of acquisition contracting to deal with critical path, path issues. And so again, I've said many times, know your business deal. Know your business and know the deal. Know which items are truly critical to the success or failure of the business and make real sure when you're doing the, the acquisition contract and then the, 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 the uh, uh, execution contracting that whatever those are, that you have appropriate covenants, representations, warranties, and the like that you can go back on and rely on and make sure are enforceable against the counterparty for their performance. Uh, contract inconsistencies, and, and I'm going to I'm going to hit this one quickly. Uh, this is the one of the areas that I was talking about that was four years in litigation. Went up to the Court of Appeals here in Texas twice, and very nearly went to the Supreme Court. It was actually appealed to the Supreme Court, and then was settled by the parties before the Supreme Court. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry, that's not right. After the Supreme Court issued its notice that it was not going to accept the case. Um, uh, and, and, and what was important about that was the second appeal ended up causing the, uh, uh, what was called a remand of the case back to the trial court for a new trial. And it, the second time up, the appellate court actually granted a new trial, which changed the entire landscape of the negotiation between the parties in trying to settle the deal. It couldn't be settled, and it needed to have I mean, a critical path item needed to be reestablished. And ultimately, my client ended up winning on that second appeal and got a new trial declared. And that then changed the negotiating landscape. And they were able to settle for an amount that was rational instead of this ridiculous amount that was being asked for by the counterparty. That conflict arose out of a deal that I was the acquisition lawyer on. Actually, not, it wasn't an acquisition. It was actually a joint venture arrangement on some services, goods and services. And really, there were counter contracts. There were several contracts involved. And, and, and that's really the point. B because there were contracts involved by multiple entities, not just two contracts by the same entities for counter services, but by multiple entities within the affiliate groups, uh, uh, it was my determination that that those contracts would stand independent of each other because they were independent contracting parties, even though the, the counterparties were controlled separately or were controlled internally by the opposing parties. But, but it was my view that because they were truly separate uh, parties to each of these two substantive contracts, that they wouldn't be combined together. And, the, and, and the, the plaintiff's lawyers, who were very good, um, were able to, the counterparty's lawyers, were able to convince the trial court judge early on in the case that these two contracts should be read together. And because of that, there, was, there were two provisions that could be read as conflicting with each other. If you read them independently, there was no conflict. But if you read those two contracts together, you added the pot, you now made it possible to, to read a conflict in and require an interpretation by the court of what that conflict meant. And because the judge agreed with them that there was, that they should be read together and that there was a conflict, they ruled on behalf of the other party 
um, in terms of the, the way that contract should be read. That was critical for my client it, it, because it, it lost a remedy that it would have otherwise had that was a significant negotiating leverage tool to get it settled. And because we lost on that issue, it took four years worth of up and down, back and forth, trial and everything else, millions and millions of dollars worth of legal fees to finally get it back to the place where the, where the, 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 the appellate court d denied that, that claim, that finding, and, if, and, and, and set aside the trial court's judgment and everything that had happened in the first trial and sent it back down for a brand new trial again four years later. At that point, the parties on the other side knew that they weren't gonna get the same result. And so they decided to settle. What I'm telling you is contracting inconsistencies can come up in ways that are unexpected, just like everything we've talked about here. Remember that when you're, when you're working on contracts and reading through contracts. Failure of or insufficient practical remedies. Let me give you an example of that. We're doing a deal right now. Uh, won't, won't name it, but we're involved in, in a deal right now where confidentiality and uh, a non-disparagement, what's called a non-disparagement clause. That means that, that I won't talk bad about you and you won't talk bad about me. We're going to settle this and we're not saying anything about it. We're not disclosing what the terms are. We're all going to be happy guys and go down the road. We're giving each, you know, releases, complete releases and all that sort of stuff. And we're both going to shut up and say nothing, except that the, the lawyers are, are able to say, the parties and the parties are able to say, we have, we have settled the matter and, and, and have no, lo and no longer have, uh, you know, uh, no longer have claims against each other. Kind of period, full stop. Can't say anything else. If you do, the provision says that, you're in, that, that the counterparty is entitled to take action against you. The question is what action? And normally in those kinds of non-disclosure or non-disparagement settings, the only way you can, you, you can enforce that is what's called temporary restraining order or an, an injunction temporary injunction and then a final injunction where you can keep the party, you go and enforce the contract against them and get a judge to say, yes, you can't say anymore, don't say anymore, under penalty of you know, coming back here and I'll sanction you and make you start paying money, right? But you get an order from the court. The problem with that kind of thing is that it ordinarily you go down and get an injunctive remedy, you have to put up a deposit. The party that feels like they've been wronged and goes down and sues the other party for saying something bad about the, the counterparty in the market has to go down and sue. You gotta go file a lawsuit. And to file the lawsuit and ask for an injunctive order, which would be a, a temporary restraining order for the first 14 days, here in Texas anyway, you probably have to post a bond because the, the judge doesn't know whether you're gonna be right or wrong, right? We're not having a trial right now. We're just gonna grant you relief and tell that other party to be quiet. Why? The judge is not going to know whether you're right or wrong. And so you end up having to put up a bond unless the parties have agreed otherwise in their contract. So when we negotiate those kinds of deals, we always put a provision in the document that says without the requirement for bond. Because I don't want a court having trying to determine that, oh, well, in, in order for you to get a TRO to keep that person you know, from saying anything bad about you or disclosing confidential information, we need a million dollar bond. Pending outcome of the trial, which could be three, four years, right? Well, time out. No, no, no we don't want to do that. We want to enforce this immediately. So contractually, we get a, a, a provision in our documents that says without the requirement for, 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 for putting up bond. Think about that. These are remedy issues. Your lawyers are going to know about that. Get good lawyers, ask the right questions. That's your only remedy, because what are you gonna do? Horses out of the barn, they've already damaged your reputation. What are you gonna do? You're now gonna sue them and try to get a money damage against them, right? Get a, get a judgment against them for a million dollars, but it's a settling party that has no net worth, <laughs> right? It, the, the remedy is worthless at that point. So this is this point of, of uh, number 11, failure of, or insufficient practical remedies. Make sure your remedy, I had a, a, a partner ask me two years into my law practice, and he actually has a famous last name um, in the oil and gas circles in Texas. Um, 
And I, he, he, I, I drafted something for him, a contract for him, and I walked back into his, his office very proudly and handed him the contract. And he said, sit down. So I sat down and he started, he, he literally flipped to the back two pages. Put it down on the desk, didn't read any of the substance. And said, okay, so let me ask you a question. Let's assume you've drafted this perfectly and it says exactly what the business deal is. What's my remedy if they breach? I, I, I guess you sue them. Well, how is that going to work in this particular deal? How is that going to work? How's that going to that get me what I need to get if I have to go sue them? You need to go back and think about an appropriate remedy. Go redraft the remedy section, please. It's the first thing he did. Just flipped to the remedy section and went, oh, okay. Not going to work. I'm telling you, it doesn't do any good to have the best contract in the world unless it provides for the appropriate remedies that you can actually enforce and that your client can get something from, right? All right. So we see some of that in our, in, in our practice. And then enforcement of rights, controversy forums and risks. And I'm sorry, I've run over here a little bit. But, but this, this one's also important. And one of those things that uh, throughout your career, please, please, please walk away from this place, whether you come back here or not, please walk away from this place and don't ever say, don't ever say, oh, well, that's just boilerplate. Please don't ever say that. Because that stuff that, that business folks <coughs> call boilerplate, the last half of a contract that's all the, you know, whys and wherefores, you know, as people would like to say it, right? That there's the remedies clause, assignability, uh, a jurisdiction, uh, uh, choice of law, those sorts of things are critical to the determination of your client's rights and its outcomes at the end of the day. And this idea of Controversy forums and risks is incredibly important. And there are, I can get litigators in here who would disagree with what I'm about to say, but I would disagree with their disagreement and we'd have a further discussion about why. And that is in a commercial matter, we're not talking about, you know, we're not talking about uh, a, you know, a car accident case out here. It's not what we're talking about. We're talking about commercial matters. In a commercial matter, Juries are the worst possible thing you can imagine. I watched a jury take my contracts apart in that four-year litigation we were talking about. Absolutely had no clue, couldn't understand it. Weren't going to understand it. Sophisticated legal documentation. Sophisticated. And negotiated on the other side with sophisticated legal counsel on the other side. So I say to you, please pay attention to enforcement of remedies and forum jurisdiction, jurisdiction of forums, right? So if, it, if it's got an arbitration clause, make sure it's right. If it, has a, if it has a clause that allows for enforcement by injunction or other operation, please get it right, right? Look at that. Those things are critical track items. They matter. They matter every single day. They always do. Okay, so anyway, uh, time to resolution is very important. We use in our contracts here at Reef, we use arbitration provisions that mandate specific kinds of procedures if there are controversies between parties. That the effort is to shorten that controversy time so that we don't spend five years in litigation. Okay? That we get to a resolution very quickly, commercially, and get on down the road. We think that's in our best, our best interest and the best interest of the parties. Okay? So don't waste your time on that. All right. So any questions that this has been obviously, you know, again, like always drinking through a fire hose.